before the break, we do to some extent a little sidestep here, but it's a nice place to make this sidestep, I find, and it's an important little thing because it relates to the simulation issue and to what we have just done. And this is which, something which is called propagation of error, which is something I think is relevant to talk about in all statistics courses. And in a way, it's just putting some other words on what we really do most of the time in our course. What do we do in a statistics course? We think about how errors propagate, how if we have some variability on the individuals, how do this error propagate? Propagate means sort of work their way through. Um, when we look at the final result, and this is something all people that from chemistry, physics, biology, whatever, people in the lab, when you do measurements, when you have different uh, noise uh, sources, and you combine things into a final number at the end of the day in the lab, maybe through some chemical process formulas or whatever, uh, you should be worried about the concept of error propagation. How does noise propagate through the system on your final number? How much noise, how much error is there on my final number? That's the terminology when you talk about error propagation. And that was actually what I was doing. I was, I'm jumping back here. I was actually doing a bit of error propagation thinking in this nonlinear system consisting of x times y. What if, what if x comes with error, y comes with error? Well, how, how does the error propagate? How does the error go into, into A? I mean, what is happening in A when X and Y comes with their individual sources of variability? The general way of expressing this to putting this thinking into math and into formulas looks like this. I'm stating that the challenge we are facing when we are talking about propagation of error, is this one. The challenge is that we would like to know the variability, sometimes we call it the error, the noise. We have many words for this thing. Um, that what is the variance of some potentially nonlinear function of many individual items that could come in with each their noise term or error term, their variance. So generally, this is a very general, uh, this is a very um, ambitious thing that I'm uh, putting up here that I would like to handle. I would like to be able to find and know the noise of any kind of function of a lot of inputs. Before I just had x1 and x2, I called them x and y, right, length and width. There could be many different inputs to the same system. And they could constitute my, my uh, number of interest, like the area, could be a nonlinear function. And if you're interested in um, how much energy can you extract from a windmill, for instance, try to think about what complex, this is a simple number, the energy that comes out. How many inputs are actually contributing to the amount that you take out of a windmill? There are lots of, and what are there are nonlinear systems and very unpredictable systems like the wind and uh, the way you control your windmill and the way you try to control everything in a windmill with the direction and there, there are a lot of things going into such a system. Still, you would like to know the variability of such a number. So it's just to say that uh, being able to handle the area is one step towards a complicated future where there are a lot of nonlinear systems that you would like to be able to know how error propagates through nonlinear systems. I bet you it's important for uh, the energy and for our country to be able to know with high certainty such variabilities in a windmill because the more you know about the uncertainties, the more you can press it, the more you can push it, the more you can extract, the more power you can extract from your system. So it's extremely important to get uh, most, the most out of such windmills, for instance, that you have reliable noise and error propagation things going on. Part of this is to know the statistics and part the general formulation is like here. I need to know this. I say this is actually just to some extent touching on something that we already know. At least if this potentially complicated function is not so complicated, it's only a linear function. If the function of all the inputs is a linear function, this is the variance rules that I taught you a few weeks ago, and we had the 
uh, airline passenger example of an application of this rule. So this is the variance rule for a linear combination. But now the point is, I'm more ambitious now. I'm saying that f could potentially be a nonlinear function of all the inputs. It could be any complex function, actually. Then we have this classical error propagation approximate formula. That's uh, important to emphasize. It's an approximate formula that tells us that like the formula in the linear case, where we combine each individual variance, then in the formula for the nonlinear function also combines each individual variance, but the things that it combines them with is not a simple a, it's not a simple coefficient from the linear expression, it's a derivative of the function with respect to each individual uh, x here. So we need to be able to find derivatives um, of uh, nonlinear functions to be able to apply this rule. I actually jumped this here. It's not so important at this point. You can actually, let me just spend two minutes there. So, uh, there was a point here. Um, it's just to say, this is a classical formula, this one here. This is a classical formula you can find many places, and I, I bet your teachers in, in chemistry or physics or so, uh, they will know this formula and probably apply it in many different contexts because that's a well-known formula for how to deal with such things, even though you're not a stats expert. Um, you can actually skip this formula also. If you, if you don't, and this is also a teaser, if you, if you cannot cope, I don't want to find that even finding the derivatives is, is too much on me. And if you have a complex function, that can be a challenge. At least it can be a challenge analytically, but then we, ask, we also have computer methods, actually, to find uh, computational de 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 derivatives without simulation, but uh, that's another story. We can also do it completely without and just do a simulation approach, and then we could simulate all these, simulate and assume that the errors, that's, that the, the additional assumption comes in, and assume that the errors of each individual source is a normal distribution, and then just look at what happens again, right? And then just calculate the standard deviation of what comes out of the nonlinear system, right? We calculate the output 10,000 times, and then we calculate the standard deviation of the output, just like I did with the area. And then we have a standard deviation corresponding to what is presented to us in the error propagation rule. Let's try it the error propagation rule as it comes, uh, just for you to see. Because there are, you can't be confused about how to use it. What, what are the x's? What are the y's? Hello, what, how should you actually use it? Let's see about this system. We are back into the area story. We assume this should actually be a small x, that we have an observation, 2.05 meters of the length. We have an, another observation, 2.99 meters of the width, and we assume that we have that the variance of x is like it was given to us a few slides ago. Let me see if I can remember that. What was the variance of x? That was 0.1 here, 0.1 square. I go back. I hope I can remember the other one. We could also call this sigma x squared, if we want. What was sigma y squared? That is the variance of y. Did I remember correctly that it was 0.2? Good. That, that is given to us now. That is how we should work with it. Now, now we get the question, what is the variance? What is the uncertainty of a given Number. Yeah, we, given this, we, we estimate for this particular, or you could say we, have, we, we put one plate through, through the lab and we estimate uh, that it comes at 6.13. What, what is then the variance of A here? Well, the way we should use the formula, since the function 
and play is x times y, right? That's the function that we are looking at. The area is a function of x and y. Then to actually find the variance of this function, if we apply the error propagation rule that I just gave you, we should take the derivative of f with respect to x and square it times the variance of x. And then there are only two terms. We should take the derivative of f with respect to y and square it like this, right? Now, what is the derivative of f with respect to x? Now, this is where we have to remember our basic uh, math on finding derivatives. As a function of x, this is, uh, there's just a constant y here. So the derivative of f is actually y, right? And the derivative of f with respect to y becomes x. Because if you see it as a function of y, there's just a constant times y, and the constant is named x. This means that we have the, the way the formula looks like this. And then, actually, there are, if we knew the means, we could have done something, maybe. But the classical way of using the formula would be to plug in the observed y times the variance of x times the variance of x plus the observed x. Now I did a mistake here. Let me, I set y and I wrote x. We should plug in the observed y. The observed y was 2.99 squared times the variance of x. 0.1 squared plus 2.05 times the variance squared times the variance of y, which was 0.2 squared. And let's try to calculate this number. I prepared it here. 0 0.2575. This is the variance of. Thank you. Like this. Um, yeah, that's, that was just showing you how to how to apply the formula in a specific case. The few times I tried to put make an exam question on this issue, the rate of correct answers have not been extremely large on this particular topic. So uh, I realize this is probably difficult for many people to think in these terms. Um, but I, it's an important rule that plays an important role also in many other uh, contexts. So I like to bring it in. <coughs> anyway, as a final slide before we make a break, I'm not going to take you through this. I was just going to show you the idea of the error propagation rule. It's the same idea as the simulation. It's kind of trying to avoid the exact and formal theory. Because, the, in fact, the error propagation rule is kind of a, it's a Taylor approximation. It linear, linearizes, linear, it makes it linear, um, the, the, the thought about the, uh, the nonlinear function. It could be solved here. I mean, the variance of the product of two things can be f solved uh, theoretically and analytically. It's actually almost not more complicated than we could do it in our course. The only thing we need is to know that the mean of two independent random variables, and in fact, we could prove this statement also like this, that this is a theoretical result if x and y are independent. Now, we don't discuss the concept of independence versus dependence in our course. So it's not a, a thing that plays a role in our course, but both things happen. If they're independent, this is the rule, and this can be found. And at the end of this, you will see that the theoretical variance of the product of those two things 
is actually the sum of three things. Where these two things are basically the two things, more or less, not exactly, but more or less, that we use in the error propagation rule. It is a thing using something from the variance of x and something from the variance of y. And then look at this, it's times y squared and x squared. Not exactly, it's times the y, mean of y squared and mean of x squared, but it's the same expression. And then a third thing, the theory. The thing that the error propagation rule ignores is actually this part. This part is ignored by error propagation. Error propagation rule. But look at the size of this. It's not big. And that is why it's working, and why the, that's a theoretical thing. This because this becomes a fourth order or a second order, whatever. It's the, you square two square things, and then it becomes a fourth order. So it, the error there becomes actually smaller. This is essentially Newton Raphson or the narration thing uh, taking place. This was just to show you that. But uh, what do you want? Would you like to go through the proof of this, or would you like to do? Something like this. Make your pick. It's up to you. In this course, I'll give you this tool. I'm not going to give you the other tool. The other tool is definitely important also. I mean, we could not cope without the guys that can do the math for us. But I definitely like the idea of being able to do the same thing as those guys like this, right? That's nice. Let's do the break now. <laughs>